Any discussion on the Constitution? A lot to go. Article 1. Uh, legislative branch. Article 2. The Executive Branch. We covered the basics of what uh, requirements of the presidency. Um, Now, one thing you have to understand about the Constitution is political parties are not written into it. Something came along afterward. In some countries, they, political parties are written into it, but not into our Constitution. We can do them with or without them, but political leaders decided it was easier to have, a, have political parties. People were running as a ticket, a set, uh, set set of um, agendas and goals that uh, people would run on. Um, talk about the Electoral College. And so they decided it was going to be a um, indirect election. Because of the Freedom Assembly we have in the Constitution, we can have any number of political parties we want, found for pretty much pretty any reason. But basically it's been Primarily, just two main parties. Get more detail later on, but uh, goes to the electoral college. In here, we've got a got a neat little website to show you here. Yeah, I find a lot of neat websites. Um, and this one is. Dave Leap's Presidential Election uh, Atlas, uselectionatlas.org. What he does, this guy went through and cataloged all the uh, election totals and state totals for every election going back to the uh, beginning. So who won what where, uh, this case here, major candidates, Biden, Trump, uh, 51 to 46 point eight spread in the popular vote, but uh, uh, 306 to 232 in the uh, Electoral College. So the results here. Dakota. And you see the uh, minor party candidates. Yeah, these are all the people who actually ran uh, in every state. But some only are on the ballot, maybe one or two states really were right in. <clears throat> I can say this one guy here who got 29 votes. Didn't even get members of family vote for him. Actually, got actually a result right here is Dick Skull, the independent. independent. And some unusual parties like Joseph Kishore and the Socialist Equality Party. There are several different socialist parties. Approval voting, I have no idea what they're standing for there, but they got like 409 votes, so no one else knew what they're standing for either. Um, independent, Independent American, Life and Liberty, 1,300 votes. There are green parties. Um, Prohibition. They are still running a ticket. They are still against alcohol and everything else. They got 4,800 votes. Man named Phil Collins ran, not the singer. No, I think he's, knowing his history, he's not in favor of uh, prohibition. Yeah? So there's still, like, words against it? Before? Still people against, uh, still want to go back to prohibition. But isn't it like, 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 like a horrible, like, best? Thing that didn't really work out. Yeah, the 1920s, early 30s. Oh, yeah, gangsters and everything. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Did they know that? I think they've been briefed. <laughs> so why do they want that? But they decided, well, we still think alcohol is a bad thing. So we're going to make a decision. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe Phil here uh, wanted to has a little something going on the side here. Don Neptune ahead of Dari Hunter, the Progressive Party. Red Roses. 
no idea what they stand for, but it, it's kind of a clever one. It, uh, yeah, you have socialist equality, social, socialism and liberation. Um, and these people here, Rocky de Fuente, Loriva, they run for something every year. They're called, they're called perennial candidates. Ray Hawkins, the Green Party, more success. Libertarians, they usually on ballot in almost every state. Um, and uh, they get about a percent, a little less and more sometimes. But it's always, but ever since 1856, it's Democrats versus Republicans. Okay, so this is just this year. Let's say, look at uh, 1964. Big blowout year by Linda Johnson. Arizona by a matter of only 5,000 votes, but that's because the guy who was uh, Barry Goldwater was from Arizona. States like Wyoming going solidly for the Democrats. Uh, Johnson at 57% of the vote to Wyoming. 55%, 58% in North Dakota, 55% in South Dakota. Even winning Idaho. Wide margin to Vic. This is the uh, this is the highest vote uh, percentage of any candidate in history, 61%. Lyndon Johnson, 64%. Were those the candidates running? Yeah, but they didn't have San Jay. Can't chance against LBJ. Social slaver, social worker, prohibition. States' <laughs> rights, Constitution, universal. Yeah. Let's go back here. Uh, on the big wipeout years, 1936. Here you go. FDR in a landslide. Uh, 10 million votes, 60.8% of the vote. Wins every state except uh, uh, Vermont and Maine. 55% for Alf Landon in uh, Maine. And uh, 56% for Alpha Landon and uh, Vermont. Everything else solidly democratic. Uh, there's some here. 98% vote for Roosevelt in the Democrat in South Carolina. 63% in Idaho. 61% um, in Wyoming. Arkansas. This was the most solid of the solid South. 81%. They see people change, voters change. Uh, people grow old, they uh, uh, die off, new generation comes in, and these vote totals change around. Go to the 1972 election, it's the complete opposite. But uh, Maine and Vermont are solidly Democratic today, they were solidly Republican back then. Let's find a fun year for Prohibition. Um, Nineteen twelve. They had uh, very rarely to get a third party candidate to win uh, electoral votes. In this case is Theodore Roosevelt. Felt like uh, Taft, uh, the Republicans have stolen the nomination from him, so he runs his own third party ticket and runs at eighty eight uh, electoral votes. Taft gets only Utah and uh, Vermont. And Vermont uh, very narrowly over Roosevelt, 37%, 35%. And Utah. I've never seen so Yeah. <laughs> Except this guy colors it, had it shaded different colors showing the percentages. Yeah. But yeah, this is in Utah. Uh, Taft by 6,000 votes over Wilson. Prohibition, this is a better year for Prohibition, 208,000 votes, 
what, 1% of the vote. This is about the most they ever got. This is the high tide of socialism in the U.S. Uh, Eugene Debs gets 900,000 votes. Wilson comes out on top. California goes for Teddy Roosevelt. Um, narrowly, it's like a 200 vote margin over Woodrow Wilson. Basically because Theodore Roosevelt so popular and his running mate, um, Hiram Johnson, was governor of California. Color so dark here because yeah, it's darker red for deeper red states and um, Democratic states. 95% for Wilson in South Carolina, 89% uh, for Wilson in Mississippi, but just 39% in Kansas. Let's see home states here. Jersey, Ohio, Indiana. This is an interesting year. Prohibition Party getting 10,000 bucks that year. Neil Dow. I have a question. Yeah. In 2020 or whatever, is party today changing them for 2024? Oh, uh, not yet. We didn't see kind of where they stand. 2020, how many people, like, where is the amount of people, like, what's like that? Had the most people voting? Yeah, uh, I don't know. I'm not sure we can see it, that breakdown that easily, but, uh, like I say, 4,800 votes, so it's kind of hard to figure out where they're at. <laughs> uh, we have to go, like, state by state. But the most votes have been uh, California, 17 million. Biden wins uh, by a margin of 5 million over Trump. He's saying by a billion over Trump in Illinois. Got to remember, different states, they have different qualifications for who gets on the ballot, different deadlines. For example, North Carolina, they're mailing out ballots tomorrow. That is their deadline. Uh, some states, they're already mailing out ballots, but they're basically being printed right now. Ballots are about to start being cast. But, um, oh, yeah, here's a funny one here in Vermont. A, uh, uh, the Grumpy Old Patriots Party gets 1,100 votes. <laughs> Well, Gary Swing, uh, uh, the Boiling Frog Party gets 141 votes. Phil Gons of the Social the Prohibition Party gets 137 votes in Vermont. Pretty much in, uh, to get on the ballot in uh, Vermont is just basically show up. Mm -hmm. Just write your name on a piece of paper and say, here you go. Are there any funny ones like cat? No, well, uh, if it's there Kanye West funny, um, he ran as a defendant. I'd say, yeah, you get some of the Grumpy Old Patriot Party, um, and the Boiling Frog Party, and the Bull Moose Party. Keith McCormick gets 126 votes. Yes, you get some uh, very unusual ones. Mexico has some funny ones here sometimes. Socialist parties and so forth. Let's take a look at California. Shows by county who's voting for who. Um, 
Los Angeles, basically here, Los Angeles, the suburb is mostly Democratic. That's some of the ex-urban counties are uh, Republican. Central Valley, Northern California, fairly Republican. Congressional district here. In the later years, he's able to get uh, into that one. Trend here. Democratic in most counties. A lot of riding candidates here. California's a lot of things that you have for standards. That's the uh, oh, yeah, let's. Six Democrats dominating the South and uh, uh, Midwest, Republicans getting the upper states, Maryland going to uh, Miller Fillmore, the American Party, in all electoral votes. Forty. Have the Whig Party and the Democratic Party. Democrats are the oldest surviving political party in the United States. Um, they go going back to the seventeen nineties. But it's all, basically it's always been the Democrats and whoever the anti-democratic party is. I mean, anti-democratic is in, against democracy. Just whoever's opposing them. Didn't they like switch? In a lot of ways, they did. Well, not some ways they did. Um, positions on civil rights, uh, because uh, Southern conservatives dominated the uh, Democratic Party for so many years. Uh, a lot more hesitation towards embracing civil rights, but um, Northern Democrats end up taking over the party um, as a full embrace of civil rights. And African Americans switched the votes from Republican to Democratic. Republicans came increasingly hostile to civil rights. At this point, 1840, the big issue is slavery. They're kind of divided on. No one's taking really a strong issue on it one way or another. So a lot of it's kind of coming down to just to, to uh, get loyalty of a uh, regional loyalty. <laughs> Harrison's appointing this one fairly handily. He's uh, at 69 years old. He was the oldest man elected president. So on his inauguration day, March 1841, he marches up to the podium and decides he's going to get show people just how tough he is. Very cold day in Washington D.C. Early March. Yeah, uh, delivers the longest uh, inaugural address in history up to that point. Yeah, and he catches a cold afterward, which turns into pneumonia. And 30 days later, he's dead. That's the reason why he did it, because he wanted to show he's tough. Well, show he's a tough guy, yeah. He's a yeah, man of the frontier, self-made man. That was the thing back in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. Um, not some tea-drinking little Easterner. No, you're a, you're a manly man. Um, well, they showed them... Um, That last laugh? No, it was the last uh, cackle before it kicked off. Twenty-eight. Jackson against John Quincy Adams. Jackson in a landslide. Um, and a lot of it, a lot of the. Uh, here going to uh, Adams because Adams's were just so popular in New England. But uh, Jackson's man of the frontier, so all these frontier states, he did really, really well. So it was 
Missouri very easily. 70% for Jackson. 53% uh, Louisiana uh, for Jackson. 96% for Jackson in uh, Georgia. South Carolina, they're mad at everybody at that point. They decided their uh, state uh, state legislators are going to choose the electors. North Carolina, 73% for Jackson. Tennessee's home state, 95% for Jackson. And you get some lopsided results, kind of makes you wonder yet. Was that really on the up and up? We really don't know. But, uh, but Jackson was extremely popular in Tennessee's home state. We have the first partisan election for president, Jacks, uh, Thomas Jefferson versus John Adams Sr. Again, um, Northeast going to Adams, the South and the Mid-Atlantic States going for Jefferson. The very first one. Who voted for who? Aaron's voting for George Washington. No political parties yet. Um, votes are not decided by a popular vote. Basically, it's an indirect election for the electors who then got together and voted all of them for George Washington. They didn't have popular vote in 1789. The popular vote really doesn't start counting until 1824. And because uh, at that point, 1820s and 30s, you start bringing what they call universal suffrage. That is, all white men uh, over 21 could vote. Um, the black men could vote in some states, but not very many. Um, women could not vote at all until 1920. So universal suffrage is kind of missing what they call historians refer to universal male suffrage. But uh, I mean, that's not entirely accurate. But basically, they're getting rid of all the tax-paying requirements to be able to vote, be required to vote. They're getting rid of all the uh, states are getting rid of all the uh, land-owning requirements to be able to vote. So more and more people are being able to vote. But at this point, still, states are deciding: you vote for the electors, vote for someone in the community you trust, and then they go vote for you. Got a member. They're coming out of a very elitist time. They didn't quite trust the common man. <laughs> trust to an extent, but not too far. Your trust was already in the road. Yeah. In the 1830s, there was a politician in Texas named uh, Bob Wilson, the senator. I called him Honest Bob. You see, I always, always promise his voters, I'm going to be just as honest as the circumstances permit. Bruce, what do you actually told people? But in this case here, they're still going by the original voting of the Constitution, which is each elector gets two ballots. Um, you vote twice. One of the most number of votes, in this case Washington, becomes president. Because he got the uh, most number of votes, in this case he got the vote of everybody. Adams, on the second ballot, got the second most number of votes. So they got the consolation prize of being vice president. Next lady has some very colorful comments about the vice presidency for different uh, politicians. Uh, that basically is Washington and Adams. The first one, the popular vote really starts counting, and yeah, let's go to. You have uh, this little fruit salad here because you only have one uh, political party at this point, and you have four different candidates running for president. This is how it turns out. Jackson wins the popular vote and wins the most electoral votes, but not a majority. But because it's not a majority, it has to go to the House of Representatives, the Congress, to figure out. House of Representatives will vote by state to figure out who the uh, president is, and the uh, Senate will vote for a vice president. Well, um, even though Jackson won the first round, even won the popper vote, he uh, 
gets voted down in Congress. But he comes put a late letter in support of what I call corrupt bargain. I want to show you something here. Notice these vote totals here. 365,000 total nationwide. Jackson getting 151,000. This is how quickly vote, vote totals are changing. Go to the next election, 1828. Great match Adams versus Jackson. Adams wins more votes in the 1820 election than was cast in the entire 1824 election. And he still lost in the landslide. That's how quickly the electorate was changing. All these new voters, that was changing the calculus of presidential elections. Because at this point, they start going to national nominating conventions to decide who the president was going to be. Um, 1824 and 28 decided the state legislatures, nominated candidates, political party leaders in those in the states. By the 28 and 32, they're deciding the rank and file voters go to convention and then they vote. So until the 1960s, political conventions mattered a lot because that's where the nominees are being decided. You know, though they were nominating primaries as early as 1900, it's not till 1968 that, uh, uh, 1972 that uh, uh, the political primaries are so important. They're basically deciding the nominee for the for the convention. Okay. And Jackson getting 95 percent again in Tennessee. Um, Adams getting 76 uh, percent in uh, Massachusetts. Find the website, uselectionatlas.org. Now, go to whitehouse.gov. Um, this is the official white page, web page of the White House. Um, first uh, web page set up by the, white House, by the White House was actually under the administration of Bill Clinton. But uh, every president alters, their, alters it, puts up what they want, what they feel is important. Um, Spanish language version. Um, um, back to English menu. Basically talking about what they're the Biden administration talking about what they're doing. But um, go to the White House here itself, the building. Talks about the different president talk about histories of the different presidents. Biden, I went back to George Washington. Um, and so, I understand. Would, would the White House have, if like a third party like, in charge, could they frame the one part one, the other like? Access their web page. They put up. Yeah, they put up absolutely anything they want. Trump could do the same thing at Biden. Biden could do the same thing to Trump. Yep. Yeah. There's a little short biographies in each of them. They usually have these up, but uh, Chester Arthur, Mr. Excitement himself. Um, Yeah, there's a White House Historical Society that sees up. Yeah, they weren't able to get uh, color pictures. It's a, Roosevelt's the first one we have a portrait in color. First photographic uh, image of a president was, uh, while he's in the White House, was Martin Van Buren. And it's kind of yeah, the sideburns, that was the style at the time. Um, still basically a lot of paintings and so forth. Um, we go back to the middle of Fillmore. Franklin Pierce, yeah, he's an alcoholic. Uh, Lincoln. 
think a lot getting his picture taken. So he got a lot of pictures of him. Andrew Johnson showed up to his inauguration as vice president, drunk, uh, <laughs> in 1865. He got Rutherford B. Hayes, complete opposite, a total teetotaler. Uh, did not believe in alcohol at all. Um, his uh, wife was nicknamed Lemonade Lucy because uh, she uh, only served water or lemonade at the White House functions, everything alcoholic. Yeah, people joked about his inaugural that you know, the water flowed like champagne. There's this guy, Warren Hardy. Uh, it's prohibition, but his wife is busy serving the drinks, the alcoholic drinks, to all his buddies from the Senate. We play poker at the White House. Harry Truman, who could uh, cuff bad enough to make a sailor blush. Um, Kennedy, Johnson, on into the current ones. Jimmy Carter, Master Jimmy himself. But all sorts of information on these, kind of short little uh, information on them. The first families, really the first ladies and so forth. Joe Biden, back to Martha Washington. Yeah, Jefferson, uh, he was widowed, so his uh, daughter acted as the official hostess of the White House. Similarly, with uh, James Buchanan, he wasn't married. Uh, the story is his priority wasn't exactly women, but I uh, won't go into that. So his niece, he was never married, so his niece was the official uh, hostess, Harry Lane. Woodrow Wilson, um, his first wife died at the White House, and he got remarried. Uh, Lady Bird Johnson. Um, here we go, Lady Bird. Um, back to Texas. Did a lot for highway beautification programs. Grounds itself. About all about the White House. White House building here. Yeah, Washington and John Adams never actually lived in the White House. Uh, Thomas Jefferson's the first one to actually live in it. And some facts about it 132 rooms and 35 bathrooms in the residence. Um, White House kitchen able to serve dinner as many as 140 guests. Um, 570 gallons of paint required to cover the outside surface. Officially named the White House by Theodore Roosevelt in 1901. Um, yeah, a couple different things. Um, presidential Palace, President's House, or the Executive Mansion. And Theodore Roosevelt, uh, they wouldn't let Theodore Roosevelt say it's a, uh, Theodore Roosevelt's mansion. Camp David, um, it's kind of a place where people just kind of, presents kind of hang out, kind of cabin side, home away from home. It was first, uh, it's in Maryland, right when Roosevelt first started going there, it started being called Camp David uh, after Dwight Eisenhower comes president, he nicknamed it after his uh, grandson, David. It's used a lot to host foreign dignitaries, um, from the Winston Churchill, um, it was the site of the uh, peace, of negotiate, peace treaty negotiations between Egypt and Israel in 1978 after Jimmy Carter came called the Camp David Accords, longest lasting peace treaty in the Middle East. I bet they were just, what are you doing tonight? Well, how far are you? Yeah. We're going to do it. Yeah, Jimmy was a delicate, Jimmy Carter was a delicate diplomat, but he had, he had his hands full with uh, Menachem Begin of Israel and Anwar Sadat of Egypt. 
Air Force One. Presidential airplane. It's the latest version. There have been different ones, but this is... Um, Theodore Roosevelt was the first president flying an airplane after he left the White House in 1909. Yeah, yeah loved it. But uh, we didn't actually get an official White House airplane until... Um, what was the first one? Not until uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Forty four. So the first jet was Dwight Eisenhower's Boeing 707 in 1959. Dwight Eisenhower. The colors, um, traditional colors of the Air Force One, they were chosen by John F. Kennedy. Some things about it. John F. Kennedy once said about uh, the presidency, he said, Want to be president? The pay is good and you can walk to work. Can't argue with that. That always distressed me with Yeah. Theodore Roosevelt seemed to live off being president. He loved it. Um, but most of these guys, you see it, the stress really wears them down. They seem so much older when they leave the White House. They're far over the four or eight years they lived there. Yeah. This is the White House. So. Yeah, you can send messages to them. Um, polite ones. Um, in the Obama administration, you could uh, set up a petition to the White House uh, on anything, and after a certain number, um, Obama made it his policy that the White House would respond to it. So, one petition started was the United States should build a Death Star. And it met the required number of people wanting to build a Death Star to, uh, they got an official response. Uh, and they had a guy in the press office had a lot of fun with the writing. said, seeing it would cost the uh, United States about 80 octillion dollars to build, <laughs> We don't think it would be financially responsible to build a Death Star this time. <laughs> We're already this Why not? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. But also, Congress.gov. Um, not as exciting. Um, but we can find here's advanced starches and browns. Uh, you can put in uh, examples of what kind of issues you're looking for, particular bills. And yeah, you can look up the text of bills, where they are in Congress at this point. Um, um, who's sponsoring them? Uh, what uh, they're doing right now. Got the live video feed from the House floor, from the Senate floor. Um, this is what they're debating right now in the House of Representatives, right now, H.R. 3724. The House Education Workforce Committee, um, introduced in uh, May of 2023. One of the Rules Committee, reported to the House. Um, resolution presides for one more one hour of general debate, one motion to recommit on each measure. That's right. basically what it is. And, of course, you can look up the leaders of Congress and, of course, find your own representative. Uh, here in Arkansas, it would be uh, say Bruce Westman from 4th District of Arkansas. He has his own web page here. Um, different bills he sponsored. Um, the status of the legislation. Pictures of the Congressional District. Most of Southern Arkansas and Western Arkansas just moving right and kind of around the around Little Rock. Uh, he's actually from Hot Springs. Um, but you can... Uh, was he a lawyer here? Was he a lawyer Well, let's look up his uh, biography. Federal, federal services, he should. Reporting services. Um, 
official biography. Um, serves on the Committee on Transportation Infrastructure and is chairman of the Committee on Natural Resources. Hot Springs native, Westerman is an engineer and forester by trade, an avid outdoorsman and proud husband and father of four. Graduated from Fountain Lake High School, went on to the University of Arkansas, uh, football player, uh, Master of Science in Biological and Agricultural Engineering, got a Master of Forestry degree from Yale. Worked at Mid-South Engineering Hot Springs 22 years and was a board member of the Fountain Lake School District. Yeah, I think it's Dave right here. Um, most of them are lawyers. But you want to look up something on a congressman, any congressman there ever has been, bioguide.congress.gov. This one's good. Really handy when you're up for history reports, too. But how's the biographies? Who you got? Who you want? Different congressmen in history. Uh, Joseph Carver at Carter at let's look at him for a minute. Senator from North Carolina. Um, born in eighteen born in New Hampshire, um, in eighteen twenty five. Lawyer admitted at the bar in eighteen fifty two. Um, newspaper editor in Boston in eighteen fifty nine. Union Army during the Civil War. And uh, Served in the United States Senate from July 14, 1868 to uh, March 1871. Which came collector of the Port of Wilmington, North Carolina. Inspector Posts from the East Carolina to the Southern Coast under President Hayes. Found town of Abbotsburg in North, Car in, uh, North Carolina. You have a very handy one here, BioGuide.Congress. Any um, one has ever served in Congress, or look up anybody in any session, look up my party, my position, a state. That's 123 men of a congressman from Arkansas, a uh, senator from Arkansas. Marion Barry from Little Rock, uh, Jane Woodson Bates, and the few. Olds. John Boozman is a U.S. Senator currently. So on Borland, he's been a U.S. Senator. Steve Womack, current Congressman. Otis Wingo, I like the name, Congressman. Archie McGill. He was, kill he was killed in, uh, during the Mexican War. Killed in battle. All sorts of guys. Jim Guy Tucker. Congressman before he became governor, Bruce Westerman, Effigene uh, Locke, uh, Wingo, she been a congressman for a while after her husband died. Old Joe Robinson, uh, long time U.S. Senator in Arkansas, let's look at old Joe here. Joe Robinson was actually the first uh, Arkansas nominated on national ticket. He's nominated for vice president in uh, 1928. Uh, so was uh, died, uh, keep serving the Senate until he died in Washington, D.C., July 1937. Great in Little Rock. Camp Joseph T. Robinson, north of Little Rock, that's uh, named after him. And of course, Supreme Court, home of the Supremes. Um, SupremeCourt.gov. We'll get to Article 3 in a minute, but it's basically, uh, uh, you can find out, well, interesting little uh, information, uh, trivia, but also uh, docket search, what's coming up, uh, court orders, oral arguments, argument transcripts and audio were available, um, all the different uh, decisions filed, made by the Supreme Court. And course information on the uh, uh, on the uh, courts themselves, on the justices themselves. This is 
current Supreme Court right here. That's it. Nice thing about our form of government is um, all this information, all this stuff, it's always available to the public. Um, and since some of these officers are elected, they want you to know about them and what they're doing. Especially, they want you to know what their opponents are doing so they can point that out too. Yeah. But okay, you're in office. Um, but what if you aren't in office all of a sudden? Because one thing when you're swap come into office, you're sworn in as president. You have to take an oath of office under Section 2. I do solemnly swear, or firm, because for religious reasons, some people might not like us saying they swear to anything. Uh, well, faithfully execute the office of president of the United States, will to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. The tradition since George Washington has been, they've always added, so help me God. Some of them do mean it. I hear the laugh out there. <laughs> um, but they raise the right hand up. By tradition, they put their hand on a Bible, but they don't have to do that. Um, Franklin Pierce, he took the office, put his hand on a law book. Say, but some of those little things are just more out of tradition than out of requirement. But the oath of office saying, this is what you will do, you're promising us you will do that. That's constitutional requirement. And just in case something happens during the inauguration, uh, the vice president is always sworn in first. Because this other part here um, is in case of removal of the president from office or his death resignation or inability to discharge the powers and duties to set office, the same shall devolve on the vice president. The Congress may by law provide for the case of removal, death, resignation, or inability, both of the president and vice president, depending what officer then is acts as president, and such officer shall act accordingly. Until this ability be removed, president or new president should be elected. Um So basically what they're saying is the vice president, the powers of the presidency would go to the vice president, the president is so suddenly no longer president for the resignation, death, whatever other reason. The thing is the way they put it in was it wasn't exactly clear once it actually happened in 1841. When John Tyler suddenly is the president, because William Henry Harrison just kicked off, the question was, is he actually the president or is he just the acting president? Or is he still a vice president? John Tyler uh, set the precedent in motion by saying, no, I am the president. But he did not have a vice president because there was no provision in the Constitution for replacing the vice president. There are a lot of presidents who went for extended periods without a vice president. Tyler went the rest of those four years without a vice president. So that was resolved with the 25th Amendment was ratified in 1967. Presidential Disability and Succession Amendment, 25th Amendment. And that says very clearly, among other things, one, vice president becomes president. The president, the office of presidency is vacant for whatever reason. Impeachment, resignation, whatever. But suppose he just can't discharge the duties of it because by this point, 1967, it's just four years, just a couple, just four years after Kennedy was killed. So there were a lot of questions what if Kennedy had been shot in the head but survived and wasn't able to be the service president? And some 50 years before that, Woodrow Wilson had a massive stroke for a long time. He really wasn't able to do much of anything. His wife basically was making decisions. So, question it. So they made a provision there for acting president. The president's deemed unfit. He can declare himself unfit for a temporary period of time, and the vice president will then become acting president. That's actually happened a few times. Notice this when presidents go in, go, to, uh, go in for surgery or something, they're under anesthesia, so they have someone as president making decisions for those few hours. Yep. Yep, it's happened a couple times. So. And um, 
also, um, I thought here, but uh, uh, if the uh, president suddenly comes incapacitated, the cabinet can vote to declare him incapacitated. Has that ever happened before? No. Has come close before? Yeah, once. Um, 2021, January 6th, the, the cabinet was ready to declare, a bunch of members of the cabinet were ready to declare Trump to be uh, incapacitated, unable to act as president. Yeah. So don't over try to overthrow your own government. Um, as race was vice president isn't endorsing him this year. Um, I suppose the vice presidency becomes vacant, either because the vice president gets a promotion to president, or the vice president himself resigns. There have been resignations from the vice presidency. Sparrow Agnew, when he was uh, convicted, uh, convicted of a felony in 1973. And sometimes these men just die. Um, Garrett Hobart died of a massive heart attack in 1900. Well, um, There's a provision for that. The president can nominate his own uh, vice president, but it takes a majority vote approval of both houses of Congress to approve it. So he then becomes vice president. That's only happened twice. First, in uh, 1973, when after uh, Spiro Agnew resigns, Gerald Ford, the House Minority Leader from Michigan, um, is named uh, vice president under Nixon. And then a year and a half later, Nixon resigns, Gerald Ford becomes president, and he asks for Governor uh, Nelson Rockefeller of New York to become uh, vice, his vice president. Congress Proust. Nelson Rockefeller, part of that big John Rockefeller family, a lot of money. Um, his brother actually was governor of Arkansas in the late 60s. That went to Rockefeller. And his son became a lieutenant governor. Uh, so I said, what does the president actually do? Now, second two here. The president is commander in chief of the armed forces. It means everybody answers to the president. The lowliest, gen lowliest uh, private to the highest general in the admiral. Why do we do that? It's because. Civilian control of the military. They would avoid the problems of coup, military coups and other they had in other countries. Um, so uh, they wanted the military to make sure they understood: you take orders from the civilian government. And said, so if you don't like it, well, get yourself another job. But that became ingrained as part of the tradition of the United States military. Back for many years, um, a lot of members of the military wouldn't vote at all because they thought it was unseemly to for a military man to have a political opinion. But they can vote, and they are allowed to vote. In some countries, members of the military can vote, particularly in a lot of countries in Latin America, because they've had too many people in the army trying to... Uh, overthrow the government too many times. Uh, president shall receive uh, services for compensation. He gets a salary. Should now be increased or diminished in the period. Um, first, a salary for the president was George Washington. He had a salary of $25,000 a year. At that point, one of the highest salaries in the nation. Modern president, this has been since uh, early part of the century, for the last 20 years or so. President gets a salary of about four hundred thousand dollars a year, and when you retire, you get that salary for the rest of your life. Plus, you get uh, Secret Service protection, plus uh, free office space. So, being an ex-president is nice for you. You can get it. Um. President shall have the power to grant pardons. He can commute sentence or grant pardons. Uh, this 
power has often been very controversial because there is no no check on it. The president can uh, pardon anybody he wants to for any reason. The question has been raised, can a president pardon himself? Not certain, but it's always been the tradition that you cannot serve as your own judge in a, in a case, so probably not. It's still kind of vague. Uh, the Supreme Court ruled this summer that the president has absolute immunity for any official act. Can do absolutely whatever he wants and face no consequences for it. He cannot be uh, arrested or imprisoned or fined for anything he does. So basically, there are no checks on the president. Any president now can do anything he wants. That's the danger of that. All was twisted, the Constitution was twisted around in such a way that there are no guardrails now. The president now has absolute and unquestioned power because absolute immunity for every official act. So yes, the president can order an assassination and that's legal now. So there's been some proposals in Congress for a constitutional amendment to say no, the president is not immune. The president and all uh, federal officials, they are subject to the law and to any criminal prosecution for any laws they may break. Including make the provision making official, no, a president cannot pardon himself. But that's still the proposal stage. All, this, all sorts of amendments being proposed, but uh, very few of them are get to the, actually get to the floor of Congress. But yeah, you can commute sentence is basically, okay, I'm not giving you pardon, but I'm letting you go, or letting you go in another year or something, or giving you parole, or an absolute pardon. Gerald Ford pardoned Nixon uh, in September 1974, a month after Nixon resigned. Some question if that was a, a quid pro quo deal, but uh, there's no evidence to support it. I think Ford's not just really, really wasn't that kind of guy. Nixon was, not Ford. Uh, and this has caused a lot of problems in states. Uh, now, there have been a lot of states where uh, the governor was impeached uh, or run out of office because they're accepting bribes to give out uh, pardons. Texas is one such case. So, in a lot of cases, particularly Texas, any pardon has to go for for a pardon board before, uh, and they have to prove that request before it goes on to the governor for approval. In Georgia, the governor doesn't even have pardon power at all. It's simply a separate independent board. And they only grant pardons once you've completed your, your time in jail. The president uh, can make treaties that is going to represent the United States in these negotiations and the signings of it, but the official approval has to go to the U.S. Senate. A ratification by the Senate. He has the most checks on his power. With a two-thirds vote. The president shall nominate with the advice and consent of the Senate a uh, simple majority vote, appoint ambassadors, uh, uh, judges, cabinet officials. Now, the cabinet is not officially part of the uh, Constitution, but the president, can, they said that he can have a board of advisors with the advice and consent of the Senate, because there are just so many things going on, just such a complicated job. He has to have a, he needs a, a cabinet. Again, appoint uh, judges, ambassadors. Also includes um, U.S. attorneys and so forth. And it approves with a simple majority vote. 
But suppose the Senate is out of session, because the Senate was out of session for extended periods of time during this time period. This time period. Well, they have what they call a recess appointment. The president can appoint someone, and that uh, nom and they stay in office until um, until the uh, next uh, next session of, of the Senate. Get down to the bottom. Power to fill up all vacancies may happen or the recess of the Senate by granting commissions, which will expire at the end of their next session. State of the Union Address. They have to give a periodic annual report on the State of the Union. Uh, recommend uh, to Congress consideration of measures which shall be just necessary expedient. Um, Basically, the president can recommend legislation, but cannot act, cannot uh, vote to enact it. You got the votes to approve it or veto it. That's sign, signs that are vetoed. It. The State of the Union address. That's an annual report to Congress on what's going on in the country. Now, on up until President Jefferson, this was delivered by uh, uh, in person. But from Jeff, but uh, Jefferson didn't like giving public speeches, so what he started doing is giving a written report to Congress that acted as State of the Union address. And that's the tradition for the next century until Woodrow Wilson, an old political science professor, decided to revive the tradition of delivering the address in person. So he thought that was a good way to get out his message. The newspapers would be seeing him, um, get his picture in the paper, would be reporting on it. Um, and especially once radio came on by the early 1920s, presidents kept doing that because that was their one chance every year, at least every year, to talk directly to the American people. And can he dawn to the television age? Yeah, probably one of the more annoying uh, presidential duties, because when I was a kid, all it meant was my favorite TV show is getting interrupted at night. I don't listen to this guy talk. I don't watch TV. But, uh, The president has the power that a lot of governors have. They can convene, ask Congress to come back into session to a special session. If some emergency comes up, Congress is uh, adjourned. Con the president says, no, you're coming back to Washington. You're going to finish this business. Like, for example, uh, Congress still hasn't uh, voted uh, on a spending bill for the next year. So they're planning on doing what's what they call a continuing resolution. Basically, it's a simple law that says, keep spending levels as it is for the next however long they want it. It can be any length of time, a week, a month, six months. What is on the table is extended for six months. But uh, if that funding bill is not passed by the House and by the Senate, guess what happens? The government shuts down. Because there's no money to run it. It does indeed. So if the government shuts down uh, and Congress is scheduled to leave for everyone to go back home uh, for the month of October to uh, a campaign, that money runs out September 30th. So yes, they could conceivably go home, uh, a adjourn, and the government be shut down. The president, in turn, could say, now you're coming back to Washington and you're going to uh, pass that spending bill. Something like that happened to Australia in the 1970s, but Australia's got a different system, a parliamentary system. They wouldn't pass, they couldn't pass a, a spending bill for the Australian government in 1975. Uh, they had, the, um, the government, it, government had to shut down because they didn't have any money, no authorization to spend any money. So what happened was the uh, Governor General of Australia ordered a new election. So, oh, you can't pass the spending bill? Guess what? You're going to go face the voters. And a whole new parliament was elected. And they passed the spending bill. Um, but yeah, government shut down during a, uh, an election. That's not going to win a lot of votes. Um, Democrats said it's a bad idea. Republicans said it's a bad idea. In fact, the 
Senate Minority Leader uh, Mitch McConnell of Kentucky, the Republican leader, said that is politically beyond stupid. So we'll see what happens. It runs out on September 30th, which is just about 11 days from now. On Congress, usually goes by what's called the four day, the, the I said the four day club. Um, Turn on Monday, they go home Thursday evening. Uh, so Friday, Saturday, and Sunday that you have off. It's only just a couple of work days left to even pass that bill. Congress, the session, can pass, Congress has passed any kind of number of bills they want, but this session, how many they've passed? Ten. Now, Section 4, this is the biggie. The president, vice president, all civil officers of the United States shall, shall be removed uh, from office on impeachment and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. It is, you can undo an election. If the president is committed, or, or vice president, or cabinet member, an ambassador, a judge, they can be removed by impeachment. That process is spelled out later on here, but... It has to be something very serious. Treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Which brings us to Article 3. The Judicial There actually wasn't a lot of debate on this. Basically, Congress will have the power to set up a Supreme Court. And that was it. And all uh, federal judicial Judgeships uh, underneath shall be inferior to the Supreme Court. But Congress has the power to decide how many justices there are going to be. Uh, uh, whether they have term limits or not. They've usually gone with life, lifetime appointments. Because the work uh, the has been, well, okay, suppose you have some young judge who uh, has a term limit to say five years. What's he going to do when that, those five years are up? And how's he going to rule in the meantime before some uh, law firm that could have business before his court? Potential bribery was extremely high. But the flip side of that is you're a sitting judge with a lifetime appointment. What's to keep you from taking bribes to uh, uh, rule one way or another? And what's to keep you from, um, keep you from getting removed from office? Because you need that, um, you can only be removed from office by impeachment. Next, there have been four presidential impeachments before, none for vice president, um, no convictions of presidents in the Senate, but there have been several, um, there have been two cabinet officers impeached. Um, both acquitted by the Senate, couldn't get the two-thirds vote approval. But several federal judges, however, have been impeached and removed from office. That's happened before. Um, so essentially, the federal judiciary is set up. You've got the Supreme Court. Start off with six. Been as many as eleven, but uh, the longest time, it's usually been nine. It's been nine since the end of the Civil War. Then you've got your Courts of Appeals. And then your Federal District Courts. The basic system. There are a few other little special courts here and there. Trade courts and so forth. Um, immigration courts. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, basically, goes from the district court. These go courts will go to the district courts, the court of appeals, and the Supreme Court. All cases, except for only a couple of exceptions, like disputes between states, they will start with the district court. The court, uh, the old post office downtown here, that big marble building down here across from Pete's place, that was built as a federal courthouse. Um, Initially, it was also the, the post office here in town, but completed in 1931. Real nice post office inside. Uh, it's been shut down for years since they moved over to Timberlane, but uh, 
But the first floor was the post office. The basement became a uh, nuclear fallout shelter in the 1950s. Still active there. Uh, and the upper floors are for U.S. attorneys, uh, U.S. marshals, and for uh, federal courts. Like I said, there is still a federal, uh, uh, so they, do, they still do hear, hold hearings in that courthouse. That is a, that is a, a federal district court here in El Dorado for the Eastern District of Arkansas. They go to the Court of Appeals. Now for this area, a lot of times all these court, appeals courts will do is they will actually go from place to place to uh, have a hearing. Uh, basically having these hearings in front of the people. And they've actually come to El Dorado a couple of times, been at the uh, uh, been at the auditorium here by the library and uh, here at the uh, um, uh, conference center. These are short hearings, not these long, drawn-out ones like they are in the district courts. Basically, short hearings. Basically, both sides get a short time to basically say, this is what our case is, this is how we felt I was wrongly ruled, and they will sit and... Uh, uh, vote accordingly later on, but they'll have hold the hearings here, uh, various places. Sometimes they will, again, sometimes coming back through here. Then goes to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court then will decide whether they accept a case or not. They don't have to accept any cases. It takes four justices to vote to decide whether or not to accept a case. And the Supreme Court is the Supreme Law of the Land. That's the highest court in the land. The only way you can undo the Supreme Court is it either has to reverse itself or through a constitutional amendment. It's reversed itself several times, but never constitutional amendment. Now, one quick thing. Very few crimes are actually defined in the Constitution, but there is one, treason. Because so many of these guys are in the American Revolution, they're being charged with, they're facing treason charges from the British government. So, they decided, we're going to put in a very specific charge, what, it, how, what treason is, and how you can be convicted by it. That's section 3 of Article 3. Treason shall only uh, consist only in levying war against the states, or adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. As you have to wage war against the United States or give aid and comfort to our enemies in time of war. Now, no person should be convicted of treason unless on the testimony of two witnesses on the same overt act. It can't just be someone says you did it. You have to have two witnesses say you committed this act. That's very hard to prove treason. Or an open confession in open court. Now, treason is usually a death penalty, but uh, that's not required in the Constitution. It says Congress shall have the power to decide what the penalty for treason is. That's it. So next time we'll go finish off the rest of it, 4, 5, 6, and 7. We'll go into the Bill of Rights. Questions on anything? We'll see you all next time.